<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we talk about four days. My dad turned 16 last week. So, so nice milestone there, but it's also so you want bittersweet, to talk? Uh, age there. I'm sorry? Bittersweet age there. Okay. So that's one thing we can talk about, getting older and suffering a good amount of loss. Sure. Sure, we can talk about that. Good morning. And how are you? I'm well, you? Well, since uh, Maria was asleep last time, it reminds me of a story that took place about, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. After a few years of uh, meeting Hussein, you know, we had to some extent private gatherings at his house. It was me, my mom's cousin Hussein, and my one of my good friends Mehdad, and of course Hussein. So uh, my mom's cousin Hussein was really really tired that one night, and as Hussein was talking about poetry and I suppose Quran and a few other things. Like Maria, Hussein kept falling asleep or dozing off. At a certain point, Hussein looks at Hussein and says, Are you tired? <laughs> and he says, Yes, I'm extremely tired. He says, Why don't you go to the bathroom, wash your hands, wash your face, walk around a little bit, and come back? Hello. And that is what he did. And he tried to stay awake for the rest of you know, the night. So, it's a nice little story. For me, not so much for you, to go back in time. <sighs> okay, so that's one thing on the menu. Old age, loss, regret. Uh, having more time behind you than ahead of you in the last 20, 30 years of your life. If you're lucky to live that long, uh, your companion will probably be a good amount of sickness and your body betraying you and all that. Any anything else? Yeah, yeah. Compliments, pleasure. Okay. It's like looking at his father who is sixty and saying, "Oh, you're sixty years young." You want to just smack him in the face. Uh, <laughs> Okay, anyone else? You know, questions are like going to Costco or going to a buffet and looking at a variety of different dishes and then saying, okay, which one is more attractive to me? Old age, I can't even feel it right now. Compliments, yes, please. How to love. Okay, so old age, compliments, <laughs> love. Anyone else? Well, you mentioned like love um, might be silly, but like this concept of like having a soulmate, like the, the temporary feeling, like over. Soulmate? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is true acceptance? I feel like I should go home or at least go to my office. <laughs> no, it's, it, these are great questions. I'm just not qualified for any of them. You say itching? Fidgeting. Oh, fidgeting. <laughs> Chris, anything? Reina? I have a question. I'm thinking about like justice, like, 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 like
If I was to be completely honest, I think uh, being away for two months and uh, having gone through the surgery, I think the experience has robbed me of being interested in ideas or talking about anything that uh, I'm not really quite sure why. which is unfair, unjust, because you have students who are curious and for the right or the wrong reasons. And they, you know, wake up and shower and make themselves look good and they come to class, they raise their hand, ask some relatively good questions and hoping to at least have an engaged class environment. And so here I am, and even though the questions are interesting, I can't really make myself interested. I'm not really quite sure why. Um, so let's talk about old age first and then love. We'll do the best we can. And if things don't work out, they don't work out. Anyone else before we begin? Maria? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, like someone falling asleep in your class, and how do you punish them? <laughs> <laughs> no, like a young person who um, you know can't get it together, and they are they get like you know arrested and they're like in jail. And they have to go to trial. And, um, Good morning. The dangers of living in Oakland, you get attacked. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. It's just like I have, I have a, a nephew. It's just like in a lot of trouble. Okay. So let's talk about compassion, punishment, forgiveness, love, old age and regret. Okay. So can I change the scenario a little bit? Sure. Good morning, Arwan. Oh, no worries. It's all good. Thank you. It's good to see you. As you know, um, next week will be our last week. We don't meet on the finals week. And let's just say you have taken this class relatively casually. You really haven't thought about grades or assignments. And upon hearing that next week will be our last week and the week after grades will be given, you come to my office. Maria. And you ask if there is any way you can pass this class. And you bring up the concept of compassion and forgiveness and uh, like all human beings, you try to exploit me by being relatively emotional, giving me a story of sorts that certain events have happened in your life that have kept you from really being engaged in the class and the ideas and assignments and all those things. So from one end, I've been a student. I know how it feels to be in life, to be engaged in different things, far more interesting than being in a classroom. I also know how it feels. I haven't forgotten what it means to be a student in ridiculous and absurd classrooms with 
students I didn't, I mean the teachers I didn't like. So as you tell me your story, I go back to my own experience as a student. And I say, yeah, well, you know, Maria and I were not a good fit. She tried, but I failed her, or maybe she failed herself, or maybe she failed me. So uh, my compassion for you grows, knowing full well how it feels to be a student in a classroom that is not very enjoyable. There's a branch that comes out of compassion, which is there are about 35, 40 students in the room. They all have busy lives. Maybe someone's mom passed. Maybe someone's dad got to be 60. And as a son, you knock on his door and say, Dad, let's go celebrate. We'll go have Zachary's pizza. And you realize he's sitting on the bed and he's sobbing. Because he's 60, and for some strange reason, it just makes him feel sad. Someone has come from a broken home. Someone is depressed. Someone is lonely. And then you say, okay, well, maybe someone who is depressed and lonely and sad, maybe they too want to come to my office because they haven't done any work for the class. But they're somewhat reserved, shy, embarrassed. Maybe they have too much self-respect. I don't really know. And instead of coming to the office and asking for an extension or if there is a way they could pass the class, they kind of look themselves in the mirror and say, I should go to his office, but I'm a bit embarrassed. So, well, I'll just retake the class next semester. And you realize that there is this branch called justice that comes out of compassion. I can feel sorry for you. I can feel bad for you. I can give you a great amount of understanding, both as a student, as a human being, as someone who has found themselves in an environment that's unpleasant, uninteresting. At the same time, I am left with, what do I do with 30 other students? They've also not done some work. Some are really trying hard to turn everything in the last week. Is it really just for you to come to my office, exploit me, manipulate me for perhaps the right reasons? You know, I also have to consider the fact that, well, you're not 20 or you're not 25, you're almost 70, Maria. <laughs> that unlike these young punks in this room, you know, who have a lot of time ahead of them, you don't. And so I have to consider the fact that you are a bit older, and as you get older, you're a bit more clear as to what it is that you want, where it is that you're going, perhaps, not always. So I am left to kind of sit back and reflect. Should I cut her some slack because of her age? She thought that this class would be interesting, and as you get older, your questions are much more sharper, much more reflective. And I suppose as an instructor, I have failed her because she doesn't ask questions like a 20-year-old. She asks questions like a 40-year-old, a reflective 40-year-old, who very much like 20-year-olds have had lots of hopes and dreams only to realize that life has only one function, to crush like a bulldozer every hope and dream that comes you know, to the imaginations of human beings. So what do I do with that? I want to just give you an A, but there are lots of people in this room. I also have to consider the fact that human beings are slothful. They are lazy. Reflection is tough. No one really wants to sit down and think about things too deeply because you have no idea where it's going to end up. You know, you have these ridiculous people like Sam Harris and the rest of those people, young farts, who have these YouTube channels who want to prove to the rest of us that God doesn't exist. And those who believe in God are ridiculous and infantile. And the truth is, when you put everything under the scrutiny of reason and rationality, nothing can stand. Why do you get married? Why do you go to school? Why are you alive? You know, ask people relentlessly. 
and you realize that no one stands a chance if you happen to have a very sharp, razor sharp intellect. Who cares if God exists or not? You know, the truth is human beings are just ridiculous, period. You know, and that's one thing that Socrates proved to us. Uh, the moment you want to define anything coherently, intelligently, you just fail. I want to be compassionate, but what do I do with the fact that maybe your life has been relatively easy, trouble-free for the most part, but you're just lazy? That thinking is tough. I also have to consider the fact how ridiculous the educational system is. No one can make the grass grow by pulling it. Okay, so I come to class and I say a few things, but the truth is you're only here for the grade. You're not here to understand. You're not here to examine, to reflect. And so this system is an imposition upon your psyche. It is unjust, it is unfair. And I impose upon you assignments I don't really care for. And then I have to issue a grade that could damage your future. And even if I did believe in the system, the next question that comes up is, what is a grade really? Is it not true that people learn slowly in time? You know, you get an A in the class and you fail the rest of life, or you fail this class and you're successful <laughs> the rest of life. You know. <clears throat> what if I just give you a grade, given the fact that you are slothful or lazy, like the welfare system, it was first created to give people a hand, you know, and then <clears throat> What the welfare system doesn't recognize is that human beings are habitual animals. We like things that come to you free without much work. You know, that's why we read. It's difficult to look at things, observe, examine, and just figure out the answer for yourself. You know, that's what the school is all about. You have a question, there's an answer. You know, and you don't work for the answer. I can't even bring in the fact that you come from the American culture, which is poisonous and toxic to the human soul, if there is such a thing. So tell me what I should do with your grade, Maria. Which branch of compassion should I pursue? Should I just give you a grade and forget the rest of the people in this classroom who possibly could have difficult lives. Forget the other people. But what about justice? No, I just mean, you're taught, if like I'm the one coming to you asking for the grade, then yeah, you should just be talking to me. Just be focusing on... But you belong to a community of people. Why would you even come to my office and ask for a grade? When you do know that there are other people in this room who have it difficult. It doesn't cost you anything. anything. It costs me my conscience. You could just give everyone. See, if, if I didn't care, I mean, if, if, if I wasn't aware of all the different branches, you're absolutely right. I would just give it, give you a grade and just go move on. But, you know, I've talked to some students in this classroom and life for them has been difficult. What do I do with that? Good morning, Abby. Asking. Who cares what they're asking? <laughs> this all goes back to your nephew or your cousin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Spare the rod, spoil the child. If I was to give you an A, you know, it's something that was talked about quite often when George Bush became the president and began the Iraq War. He didn't sound very intelligent when he spoke, and then a lot of people would say, only if his instructors 
at Princeton or Yale or Cambridge or wherever he went to school, if they have failed him, instead of just giving a C or a B or an A, he would be forced to kind of sit somewhere, read a couple of books, think, write good essays, and maybe he would have been a better president. No, you're right. I, you're right. This example was tough for me. But oh, I'm so I, sorry. <laughs> you're right. I had trouble separating myself from that. Um, you're right. And that's what I'm going through with, with my nephew is that I feel like he should, I feel like he should stop being the president of the United States. I feel like he shouldn't be given the breaks that he's been given. He needs to just go and punish for something. Like he's just not getting it. He's doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And I feel terrible for feeling that way. When you look at the prison system, which is awful. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the prison system, say in Norway versus America, so what you have is, let's say, my brother and I got into a fight. I grab the sharpest knife I can find. and I slit his throat. I love him. And so I get caught and I'm sent to some prison. But my prison in Norway is actually quite nice. I have about four roommates in a nice, you know, uh, little cottage filled with trees. And I go through rehab. And then I, when I'm released, I'm not a savage anymore. I'm much more reflective, much more decent. That's the punishment I get there. Here, on the other hand, you can't punish me by sending me to jail. But I come out far worse. So it's good to punish someone, but in a very educated way. You know, you come home and you're angry because your kids haven't done their work. But your, your anger is not very educational. You impose fear in them. You kind of tarnish the little relationship you have with them. And that's not really healthy. If on the other hand, you scream and even spank them a little bit, and then after they do their work, you take them to Chuck E. Cheese pizza or you go out for a walk, it's something that balances things out. So when you talk about punishment, the question is, well, in what shape and what form? What are the outcomes? I suppose if I was back, if I was to go back to the analogy of you not having done work for this class, my punishment for you for perhaps would be, let me give you an incomplete, which means you have till the rest of the summer to complete all the assignments. And instead of just writing 10 pages each assignment, your punishment is to write 20 pages for each. And that's about like 10 assignments. And that's about 200 pages. But you have about three months. And once you're done, I'll just give you an A. You may not like me, you may not like the work, but at least you'll get an A, and you will have done the work. That's a good anger, that's a good punishment. You don't, I mean, I understand that at your age, you don't want to come back to a philosophy class, sit here for another 16 weeks amongst ridiculous people who ask ridiculous infantile questions. I think all of us as human beings need to be punished simply because we are born in the dark and oftentimes we make decisions in the dark and life pushes those consequences into our face and you realize you've just gone wrong. You know, the regret is part of life, loss is part of life. Uh, you just need the tools to combat them. It also really depends on your age. I don't have time for you to come to the office and tell me a story. I don't really care. 20 years ago, the story would be much different. So if you know that you're lazy and you don't like a class, make sure your instructor is young and hopeful. Because when you're young and hopeful, the assumption is you can change the world and you can change your students. Judges are the same. Judge Judy. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> she's perhaps the, the best 21st century messiah. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's good to have you know, a wide range and a rich perspective on compassion and punishment and forgiveness and all that. So let's talk now about old age and his father now turning 60. My condolences. I know I gave you a poem a couple days ago. It was about a father and a son. Can I give it to you again? It's really not so much for you. It's just I love the poem. And I just like to hear myself say it in Persian. How old are you? 23. That's sad. So let me uh, give you this poem as a gift. Well, it's really a curse. And it's not about you. It's about what all parents go through, tragically enough. Pedari ba pesari gof beqah to adam nashavi jana pedar. Ef azan om ke ee bi sar o pa dar pe tabiyat ad kardam sar. Dil farzand az in harf shikast. بی خبر از پدرش رفت سفر رنج بسیار کشید و پس از آن زندگی گشت به کامش چو شکر چند روزی بگذشت و پس از آن حاکم شهر شد و صاحب زر چند روزی بگذشت و پس از آن ام فرمود به هزار پدر پدرش آمد از راه دراز نزد حاکم شد و بشناخت پسر پسر از قایت خودبینی و کبر نظر افکند به سر و پای پدر گفت گفتی که تو آدم نشوی تو کنون بنگر something like Jaham. Pi khandid pas az an begoft baad az chandi burun shod az zar. Man nagoftam ki tu hakim nashabi. Goftam adam nashabi. The father's from Yemen. Jordan. I think. <coughs> All Middle Easterners are the same. I don't know which version is better, the American Western version or the Middle Eastern version. In the West, a woman gets really excited when she gets pregnant, and so does the, the man. They just say they're married and all that. And they go to Toys R Us and buy a bed and paint the room and do all sorts of things. And once the honeymoon stage is over, once they realize that parenting is really, really hard work, and it's a work that gives you little reward back, except, you know, a giggle from the child and a laughter and a this and that. When your kid is about six months old, you sit with your husband and you say, let's get a babysitter. And so you do. You get someone from Africa, you get someone from Mexico, from India, to babysit your kid. <clears throat> and then, of course, you pursue your own passions in life. And once in a while, you're there for your child. And then as the child grows and the responsibilities for you as a parent grows, you realize it's too much work. All of a sudden, you become religious. Every Saturday, you go to church and you say, God, please, Make time move faster. I want my son or my daughter to turn 18 so they can move on. They can leave the house. 
and figure out who and what they are. <clears throat> and one of the nice things about American parents, not all of them, but some of them, is that they make sure that the relationship is not as deep. So just in case the child makes a lot of mistakes, they're not as hurt or injured. Not completely, you know, all parents suffer a little, some more than others. And so once the child turns into 18 and leaves the house because they're independent and free and autonomous and all that, the parents take these deep breaths and say, thank God. Now we can just go back to being a husband and a wife and live our lives. And just in case the kid turns out to be no good because of social conditions, temperaments, all sorts of different things. There is really no relationship between the parent and the child. The Middle East is very, very, very different. A woman doesn't get married because, well, they get married because it's the only thing they do. That's the software of the culture. At least it used to be, not anymore perhaps. You know, you get married very young, you have children very young, and your entire life revolves around your kids. And your father says, well, I'm an immigrant, we're going to take ourselves to America. You know, have a business, get a better life, our kids can go to school, do A, B, C, D. And then as a father, you turn 60. And immigrants are very insightful, you know. You graduate from high school at the age of 18. If you do things the right way, you're done with your bachelor's by the time you're 20, 21. By the time you're 23, you have your master's. And if your parents happen to be very hopeful, you know, dreamers, say, well, maybe my child can be a doctor of source by the time they're 28, 29, 30. Then they'll get married, will be grandparents and all that. So you're, my father turns 60 and he looks at me and he realizes that, well, I've been a little slow in accomplishing some of the things. He says, man, I migrated from Iran to America to see my children prosper. Here I have a son, he's still in high school and he's like 40. Here's my daughter, got married, divorced, two kids. And a father looks at his kids and says, There is this beautiful poem, forgive me for digressing. But if you want to know how I turned 60 and what has happened to my face and why is my back a little hunched and why I have lost patience and why I'm frustrated and angry all the time is because I spent all of my youth raising you. I was hoping to, you know, at the age of 60, look at this fruit called a child and then you know, make sure that his or her life is sweet, is pleasant, is prosperous, comfortable, but it's chaotic. You know, human beings are private animals. We are also social animals. In the privacy of our lives, we have dreams and hopes that, for the most part, don't pan out too well. We are also unaware of the movement of time. We don't think about it. We don't, and as Middle Easterners, we don't really think about authenticity and creativity. We're not that privileged. Life is tough. Society is difficult, politics is garbage. So our life from the time you wake up to the time you go to, s go to sleep, it's really just struggle, you know. It's kind of what people go through in Palestine, to some extent, Israel.
And as you get closer to the tomb, the grave, you kind of look at your life and everything you've accomplished. And for some strange reason, as you age, you become more honest and you realize everything you've accomplished means nothing. You know, and even though I think in the Middle East, there is no such thing called depression, you know, it's, it's, these, are, these are basically for the most part Western phenomenon that have leaked themselves into the East. <clears throat> uh, because we have an open door policy. We don't have backyards, we have front yards. The street is our home. You know, every night you have thousands of people knocking on your door, coming in, you eat food together. That's not what happens here. Here you live alone, you eat alone, you watch movies alone, you walk alone, and you die alone. And so that particular form of depression does not exist, perhaps, for your father. Maybe it does because he's been here for a while. We are also social animals as you age. You look at your environment and you say, okay, my son, my daughter, my this, my that. And you were hoping for these chapters to turn out well, but some of them happen to be incomplete. Some of them are very, very incomplete and sad and disappointing. Old age, really, for the most part, is just about loss. You just lose things. You lose your memories, you lose your stories, you lose your meaning, you lose your identity. Being a father is no longer as interesting. Being a husband is no longer as interesting, or a wife. Your body begins to, you know, uh, betray you a little bit. You sag here, you sag there. Your back, your shoulders, your this, your that. Desires that make life meaningful, desires also go away. You don't desire things as much. There are not very many things out there that give you pleasure. So, yeah, just make sure your father is never alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.